We are in Hebrews chapter 4 and 5. Obedience through suffering. Um, Jesus Christ, our Savior, he learned obedience through his suffering. He was faithful to his Father. He obeyed everything. He did not sin. So let us read uh, in the next PowerPoint screen as we get into Hebrews. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. As we continue to read in the next PowerPoint screen, it says, again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Well, what this is talking about, and we talked about it a little bit last week, is, is that all who believe will enter into God's rest here on earth and in, in eternity. Uh, the, the Hebrews, the Israelites, when they left Egypt, God was taking them to the promised land, a land for themselves to, to uh, wor work and flourish and have families and and, and love one another, but they were complaining. They were disobedient. They did not believe God. They were grumbling against God. They did not count their blessings. They did not, they did not believe God. They wanted to go back into slavery. They wanted to go back into Egypt. But, but brothers and sisters, as as good as the world sounds, as good as, uh, as much temptation is in the world, there is nothing there. It, the temptations of this world are shallow. They are empty. The only good things that, that will endure are the blessings of God in, in obeying his word. So to believe or not to believe God and his word is the most important question we face as mankind. Do we believe God or do we not believe God? If we believe God and his word and we trust Christ as Lord and Savior, we are born again. We will enter into rest here on earth and especially into uh, the eternal rest in the kingdom of heaven. Those who do not receive Christ as Lord and Savior will enter into blackness of darkness forever. Brothers and sisters, that's the, the greatest question facing all of mankind. And then even as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we still daily choose as to whether we will follow the, the word of the Lord or will follow, father, follow, excuse me, follow our own desires, our own flesh. But dear brothers and sisters, let us never harden our hearts towards God, but let our hearts be open to the truth of God's word and to be obedient to it. Let us be obedient to all of God's words of life. Remember, there, there's a saying that goes, follow your heart. How many of you heard that? Follow your heart. I'm telling you, don't follow your heart. Don't follow your heart. Follow God's passion, Amen. his word, Amen. his will for your life. Lord. Follow God's passion. Your, <clears throat> your heart will mislead you. Yes. My heart will mislead me. God's word will never, never mislead you. His will will never, never mislead you. So that was a review of uh, Hebrews chapter 4 through 7. Let's go on to uh, Hebrews chapter 4, or 4, verses 8 through 11. So as we read, For if Josh Joshua had given them rest when they went into the promised land, he would not have altered or spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. There's a rest for us, the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, we enter into God's rest through obedience of his word. Amen? Amen. It's, and, and, it's, and it's not just uh, obeying the words that we like. It's obeying all of, the, of his word. All of his word is good for us. All of his word will, will uh, strengthen us and, and give us uh, eternal blessings and, and character. 
<clears throat> the the uh, disobedient Israelites never entered the promised land because of their evil, selfish works. They wanted to follow their own desires, their own flesh. But God wanted them to follow his desires, his passion, his will, because his will and his passion for us is the best for us. Yes, Amen? Amen? God is doing uh, his very best for us, and when we follow him, we will receive the best for ourselves. The Israelites uh, never entered the, the God's rest, uh, nor the kingdom of heaven, because of their disobedience. Our, our own selfish works and ways end up in death. But God's works and ways through us end up in God's rest here on earth and in, in eternal heaven. As we go to the next PowerPoint screen, we see Hebrews 4.12, a very familiar verse. For the word of God is living, living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, what does it mean to us personally that God's word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword? Well, if we look at the next PowerPoint screen, we see it means God wants to and has to do spiritual surgery, spiritual surgery on our bodies, our souls, and our minds. Amen. So that we can enter peace on earth and into God's promised land in heaven. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 10 through 5, or 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says in the next PowerPoint screen, it reads like this. We are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> we have many thoughts in our minds that we need to take captive and make it obedient to Christ. Amen? It goes on to say, uh, and we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. Amen? To the obedience of Christ. <clears throat> you, our minds are continuously running, continuously running. There's thoughts coming in our minds all the time. We need to take every thought captive and, and analyze it. Is it in line with God's word or is it not? If it's not in line with God's word, we need to ask God to help us get rid of that thought, get rid of that thinking because it will destroy our souls. Amen? Now, if you look at that corner of the screen, it says the fruit of the Spirit grows only in the garden of obedience. Obedience. As uh, we can either, uh, God can bring something to our mind and we can either obey God or we can be disobedient. If we become disobedient, then our hearts start to become hard. The harder our hearts get, the further away we get from God. The further away we get from God, the more sorrow and anguish we will have. Remember, temptation and pleasures of this world are just for a moment, and then they're gone. They're gone. So, uh, it's important that we, uh, that we be obedient to all of God's word. Now, in the next PowerPoint screen it says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold fast on our faith. You know, there, there isn't anything that you do or think that God hasn't, that doesn't see. He sees it all. In fact, he knew it before you even did it. He knew your entire life before you even lived a day of it. God knew that. He knows that. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our, our strengths. He knows our faults. He knows what it is to, to suffer and to struggle and to have pain and sorrow. In the next PowerPoint screen, oh, and let's read that. Let's go back. Sorry, brother. Let's go back, and it says in that 
that uh, heart, even death and destruction, hold those secrets from the Lord. How much more does God, does he know the human heart? Proverbs, uh, what is that, 15, 11? God knows our hearts. So now on the next PowerPoint screen, we read, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can come boldly to God, to his throne, and say, God, help me, help me. Help me with my struggles. Help me with my children. Help me with my job. Help me with, with everything. He is there to help us with everything. And he will strengthen us. Amen. We cannot do it on our own. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ can, can sympathize with all of our weaknesses and faults and our sins because he was tempted as we were. Jesus was tempted just as you are, just as I am. Yet, he did not sin. He did not disobey. He was perfect. Amen? Now, Jesus, just before he was arrested uh, to go to the cross, he was in deep anguish and despair as he contemplated the wrath of the cup of God's fury being placed on him. We studied this in men's Bible study yesterday. Jesus was was in anguish and despair. He, he knows what we're going through. He was in anguish and despair. Let's read Luke twenty two forty four. 44, the next PowerPoint screen. And being in agony, this is right before he goes to the cross. He was in the garden of Gethsemane. He says, and being in agony, deeply distressed and anguished, almost to the point of death, he prayed more intently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down on the ground. Jesus's, Jesus sweat blood. The agony of the cross was not the physical pain of nails and thorns. The pain of the cross was his spiritual separation from God. He knew that his father was going to turn away from him because of his sin? No, because of our sin. And that was deeply anguishing to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how many have you ever heard of Jesus sweating blood before? Amen. One, he sweat blood. Now, you might think, well, that's, that, that's, that's not true. Well, it is true. There's a co medical condition called hemo, hematohydrosis, which is the sweating of blood caused by extreme anguish. You see, you have little tiny blood vessels that surround your sweat glands. And when, when there's extreme anguish, these, these, these uh, little uh, blood vessels uh, will expand and rupture and actually leak blood into your sweat glands. This is what Jesus was feeling. He felt the anguish and the, and the despair more, probably more than we, more than we have, because he was taking all of our sin. Can you imagine, say like eight or nine or ten billion people's sin on you? That is a burden that no, no, no man except for Christ could take. No one could bear that. But Jesus did, and He did it for us. And I thank God for it. So, because of what Jesus suffered for us, we can come to him and through humbleness and surrender, seek help from him by his magnificent power over all of sin. See, he, he took that sin and he nailed it on the cross and he, he paid for it and he took the guilt and the shame with it and he took, he took it all. And then he rose again from the dead to show he has power over sin, power over death. Amen? He has power, great power. We need to go to him for his power. Do you feel weak? Go to his power. Do you feel at love? Go to his love. Amen? Amen. God's waiting for us all the time. So in summary of chapter 4 of Hebrews, 
They go to the next PowerPoint screen. It says, let us fear God, meaning having deep reverence and respect for what he did, uh, but not just once in a while at church, but in everything we do, let us have respect and fear for God. The second thing, let us be diligent to enter God's rest through prayer and meditation. Brothers and sisters, there's all kinds of bad news out there. But there's all kinds of good news in prayer and meditation and being in pr the presence of our God. Third thing, let us hold fast our confession or our faith. Hold fast onto your faith. The Satan is trying to rip your faith out of your heart. The world is trying to rip the faith out of your heart. Your flesh even tries to rip your, your faith out of your heart. But let no nothing Take your faith out of your heart. Stand fast on God's word. Ask God for more faith. Help us in our unbelief. Amen. Amen. And then <clears throat> the fourth thing. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly. Because you're perfect. Not in your flesh. You're perfect in Christ's spirit. You're perfect. We're perfect. We stand before God clean and and pure because of the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansing us from all of our sin. It is not through our works, it's through his work alone. It's through faith alone in Christ alone, through the word of God alone, for the glory of God alone. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, let's jump right into chapter 5 now. Chapter 5 talk, keep, goes on and says, Every high priest is a man chosen to rep rep represent other people, in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. He's speaking to the Hebrews, to the, to the times past when they had the uh, uh, le, uh, Levi priests. And he is, a, he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is wayward and ignorant to the same weaknesses that is why he must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for others. So, so the uh, Levitical priesthood uh, was chosen by God to represent him and sacrifice animals for the sins of the people. It goes on to say in the next PowerPoint screen, And no man takes this honor to himself, for he who is called by God just as Aaron was, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become a high priest, but it was he who said to him, the father said, you are my son, today I have begotten you, begotten you, today I have made you the ultimate high priest. Jesus Christ is the picture of all the millions of sacrifices of animals that was done. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. Yes. And his sacrifice is for eternity. So, by grace you are saved through faith. It is a gift of God. It's not of works. It's not of ourselves. So that no man can boast. We are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. What an awesome God we have who gave everything for us. Jesus gave us forgiveness of sins, and he gave us his perfect life so that we have power over sin. So therefore, Jesus Christ is the ultimate priest, he is the ultimate sacrifice, and he is the ultimate God. Amen? As we read in uh, the next PowerPoint screen, Hebrews 5, 5, 6, and 7, he says... As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Uh, Melchizedek is a picture of the eternal priesthood of, of Christ. And the vehement cries that he's talking about is that when Jesus was crying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's saying, Father, if there be any other way, take this cup of your wrath from me. But he said, nevertheless, 
not my will, but your will. Even in, in you could tell that Jesus was, was totally human because his flesh said, I don't want to be separated from God, my Father. I don't want to be separated from you. I don't want to bear this burden. He, his, his humanness was showing, but the Spirit of God in Christ overruled that and said, no, you have to go to the cross. You have to go to the cross for the people, for us. God the Father didn't, didn't keep him from death, but he raised him from the death. Amen. He didn't keep him from death, but he raised him from the death because death has no power over our Savior. Amen? And now that we're in Christ, death has no power over you. Amen? Amen. There's no power of death over you. Certainly, if, if one of you was to, was to leave and go into the next kingdom, we would be sad. But we know we'd see you again because death has no power over us. Amen? Thank you, God. Well, as we read on and further in, in Hebrews 5, 8, and 10, it says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Anybody learn any obedience through your suffering? Raise your hand. We learn obedience through our sufferings. Let us therefore not complain about our sufferings. Let us rejoice that God is showing us something even greater. It goes on to say, and having been perfected, see our sufferings, God uses our sufferings to perfect us, to make us better, to make us whole, to make us more like him. For even Christ learned obedience through his suffering. Verse 10 says, Call by God as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, the eternal priest. Jesus is the eternal priest, the eternal sacrifice. That's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper because of what he did for us. Amen. So we learn o obedience through, through our sufferings and through all the episodes of our life. Anything that you're confronted with is, is God is using to make you better, to make you stronger, if we seek him in it. Amen. Praise God. Well, let's go on to Hebrews 11 and 12. It says, concerning this, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain since you have become evil, dull, and sluggish in your spiritual hearing and disinclined to listen. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, because of the time you have had to learn these truths, you actually need someone to teach you again and again the elementary principles of God's word from the beginning, and you have come to be continually in need of milk and not solid food. So here, uh, the author of Hebrews is speaking to the, the Hebrew people. He's saying, you should be further along. You should be growing. You should be maturing. You should be doing things more than you're doing. Now, I thank God for all of you that you are growing and learning in Christ to become faithful and to teach others about the goodness of the Lord our God. Now, oftentimes I see on, uh, on TV uh, ch huge, huge churches. And I see thousands of people, and I wonder, how many of those people are really saved? How many of them really know Christ as Lord and Savior? How many of them are just coming to church to fulfill some religious activity in their life? I wonder. Feeling a fleshly desire to be religious. It's not about just going to church. It's about obeying God's word and doing what God asks us to do in his church, to be his church. Then I wonder how many of those people actually serve in the church. That, that, or do they just come and go, come and go. Then I wonder how many of those people actually get into God's word daily and seek God's presence daily. And, or do they just go about their secular lives, making all their appointments without taking Jesus with them. You see what I'm saying? Then I wonder how many of them actually tell others about the saving power 
of the Lord Jesus Christ through his death, his burial, and his resurrection and their need to repent from their sins. How many of those people tell others about Jesus and their need to repent and turn away from their sins? How many of them? I wonder. Or, they just, or do they just invite others to come into church to see a spectacle of people and a Broadway-type show to be entertained instead of sharing the need for them to bow down and worship the Lord our God in faith? Now, we, we come to church to obey God's command of gathering together. Where are all the Christians? Where are all the Christians? When, uh, when we had 9-11, the churches filled up. When 9-11 uh, <clears throat> and the terrorists hit, hit the buildings in New York, the churches were filled. Then, as things got back to normal, people left the church again. Where are they? Where are they? Brothers and sisters, we need to be gathered together in church. We need to be gathered together. God inhabits the praise of his people. We come to church to equip uh, equip ourselves to learn how to tell others about Jesus. We come to church to worship the Lord. We sing songs and praises unto him, right? Amen. How great is our Lord? Amen. How great is our God? The power of his love. We, we do that to worship our God. He inhabits the praise of his people, amen? We come to church to be trained to be effectively used by the Spirit of God. Amen. So, in conclusion, as we turn to the next PowerPoint screen, in conclusion, oh, I forgot one. For everyone who lives on milk is doctrinally inexperienced and unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a spiritual infant. But solid food is for the spiritually mature, whose senses are trained by practice to distinguish between what is morally good and what is evil. Brothers and sisters, um, we, we come to church to learn how to discern evil from, from good in our, in our jobs, in our schools, in our homes, in the marketplace, so that God can use us. So now, in conclusion, the next PowerPoint screen, it says, Jesus is superior to all of mankind and above all the angels because he is the Lord God who left heaven to become like us. Second thing, Jesus suffered in his flesh like we do, yet without sin. He was without sin. He was perfect. Number three, Jesus is sympathetic to our weaknesses because he felt our weaknesses yet again with no sin with no sin. He did it. He did it, and he did it for us, and he's willing to give it to us as we surrender and yield to him, to let him be on the throne of our mind, our will, and our emotions. The fourth thing, Jesus uh, sympathizes and loves us and has given us his perfected life in us so we can live a perfected life through him. Amen. It's his work in us. It's his work through us. The next PowerPoint screen lifts a, a, lists a fifth thing. Therefore, we can come boldly to the throne of the Father because of what Jesus has acquired for us. The next thing is Jesus has equipped us to be much more than we realize. He has, mu he has much more great works for us to do. In other words, it doesn't matter how old you are. God still wants to do mighty works through you and through me. I, I want to see God do more in all of us. Amen? So let us, therefore, let God push us. Let God push us to do much more than we think we can do so that his spirit can empower us to do the things that are beyond even our imagination. Look with me in the next PowerPoint screen. <clears throat> Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him, our God, who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than we all, all more, more than all that we dare ask or even think 
infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes or dreams according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout the generations forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, let us live an extraordinary life. It doesn't matter how old we are. We can still live an extraordinary life. Here's an example. We all have neighbors. We all have neighbors that need to hear the word of God. So, bake them some brownies, bake them some cookies, bring them a fruit, uh, 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 a plate of fruit, and knock on the door and say, hey, I just wanted to be neighborly, and I hadn't seen you in a while, and wanted to talk with you, and hey, I brought you some, some brownies, some fruit, and then, and then tell them, how much Jesus has blessed you. Tell them how much Jesus has blessed you. And then ask him and tell him, and Jesus loves you, and he wants you to have a very close relationship with him. Do you have that close relationship with him? Just do that. Live an extraordinary life, because in the kingdom of heaven, God, that will be played for all, for all, <clears throat> for all believers of the things, the supernatural things that we did. So let us be bold in our faith, bold in our walk. Let us not just settle down to mediocrity. Let us be bold. Let us encourage each other to be bold. Amen? Let us bow in prayer.